Italy and, um, and, and some sort of spread around that sort of area as well. So as the church was growing, these new churches started up, so the apostles were writing these letters to these uh, different churches with the advice of how to live in the kingdom. So you are now in God's kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ, but what do you do now? How are you supposed to live? Do you carry on as you did before? Do you completely remove yourself from the world? How are you supposed to live? And that's generally what the letters deal with. Some of them in quite sort of broad brush strokes, but some of them in quite finite areas as well. And what we'll see is we get a lot of what we call our doctrine, our official teaching from these letters, because they're working out the nitty gritty of what it means to live in the kingdom, what we're not only just to believe, but also how we are to live as well. It does also tackle some particular issues, some issues that were more prevalent 2,000 years ago than they are today, but there's a lot of crossover. And um, it's incredible to read these letters written 2,000 years ago and just how applicable they are today in all sorts of different ways. Um, but there's a variety of writings, and um, some people might uh, appreciate some of the letters more than others or, or have a particular affinity with some of the verses in them. Um, some wonderful, encouraging, amazing verses in some of the letters of the New Testament as well. And there's a lot of variety. As well. Um, just before I probably get on there, I just want to flag up just a few resources though. You might want to think about what we're going to do next after, after this course is finished. Well, um, just want to highlight a few possible um, resources as well, and a few good books. Um, this book is called God's Big Picture by a vicar uh, from Oxford called Paul Roberts. And um, a lot of the material um, used in this um, has been taken from various places. The main one from a uh, course uh, done by John Irvine. I'm very grateful to him uh, for letting me use this. Um, but also some of it has come out of, of this book. And again, um, this book, he picks up on these ideas of the kingdom, um, but he goes into it in, in more detail um, and more than just five sessions. But again, there's some helpful diagrams things like that as well. And I know some of you also have, uh, might have something like this. This is a, this is a huge one. This is a real uh, way to the Bible. Um, this is called a study Bible. Um, and they're quite useful. There's lots of different ones that you can get. It's obviously a lot bigger. Don't quite fit in your pocket or in a, in a handbag quite as easily. Um, but what these have is they have all the Bible text and then underneath they also have little um, commentaries on, on Different verses, so you're reading a verse there and it will give you a bit of information about. So, there's one bit here about the Babylonians, so it was talking about one of those uh, things they do in the Babylonians to give you a bit of information um, as well. And they often tend to have sort of pictures and atlases and stuff like that. Um, and then, in terms of different types of Bible translations, you might have your own favourite one, um, but it's a spectrum in terms of what uh, Bible translations are like. Some of them are very literal. So they take those Hebrew and Greek sentences and translate them literally, which can come across a bit sort of awkward, a little bit like, like um, you know Yoda from Star Wars, who sort of says things backwards. It can sound a bit like Yoda speaking sometimes. But they're very good if you want to just look in to what does the Bible say, um, you know, word for word. But then there's some other translations that make it a bit more easier reading as well. So if you want to be reading um, you know, a, a bit more in the Bible, translation um, or something like that. It's less literal, but more kind of gives you the impression um, as well. Um, also, then, I mean, there's other wonderful resources. Um, I'll probably get around to showing a video of this. Online, there's um, a site called The Bible Project, where they've basically taken every book in the Bible and they've created these wonderful animations about them. They're, they're not cheesy, they're really good. They're quite good for showing sort of younger people as well, and they're really engaging, they go through all these different things. Um, but yeah, they're called the Bible Project um, as well. Uh, and then this is something that someone gave to me called the Infographic Bible, Visualising the Drama of God's Word. And this is one where I don't see anything quite like this, but it breaks down lots of the um, parts of the Bible into these really nice sort of graphics that shows you all the different books there, different names for God. Um, things about creation, um, uh, Moses there, uh, clean and unclean animals, the different kids.
kings, uh, all the prophecies about Jesus here we go, this is quite interesting. So we've got the Old Testament here, yeah? and these are prophecies made, and these are how they were fulfilled in the New Testament. But again, you'll never see anything quite quite like that. Um, and again, for, for people who are more visual, that might be quite nice um, as well. So I just wanted to say something about the resources. But let's get back to uh, what we're looking at today, and the, the letters. So firstly, we're going to break this up into a few different chunks, go through some of the letters, don't have time to explain what's in all of them, um, but I'll pick out a few ones of, of particular um, significance. So the first section that we have, after the Gospels and Acts, we have Paul's letters uh, to the churches. And um, uh, we start off with Paul's letter to the Romans. And uh, so he's writing to a church in Rome. And this has been a really key uh, letter throughout church history, particularly during the Reformation. Um, so many key teaching elements and doctrines are uh, found in Paul's letter to the Romans, particularly things like sin and salvation. How are we saved? Um, key verses being like this, chapter 3, verses 23 to 24, where Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift. So in those two verses, Paul is saying, there aren't good people and bad people. You know, there's not the, 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 the wonderful, saintly people who've never done anything wrong and the, the bad people. Um, actually, Paul's saying, we're, we're all in this boat together. We've all sinned. We've all sort of fallen short of the mark that God has set us. So there's, there's quite a bit of equality there in God's sense. But at the same time, how, how can sinners be reconciled to God? Well, they are justified. They are put right with God by His grace as a gift. So Paul explained there how we are made right with God. God, it's the gift that comes to us because of his grace. So some key sort of uh, doctrines there in uh, Romans. Um, then we move on to uh, his next letter, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, with possibly some of the uh, most famous verses uh, in the Bible, um, 1 Corinthians 13, wonderful um, uh, explanation of, of love. Uh, you've probably heard uh, weddings and sometimes of at funerals, but, but the context of 1 Corinthians, this church he's writing to, they're, they're not a loving church at all, they're, they're, they've got all sorts of things wrong, they're squabbling about who their favourite apostle is, um, some of them are boasting the fact that they seem to have better gifts than others, they're already excited about them um, being able to speak and these gifts of tongues and all these other things, and of course all of that stuff is worth nothing if you don't have love. So actually 1 Corinthians 13 is actually Paul telling them off. The author reads this, oh, wonderful poem about the love, his patient, love is kind. And he's saying, yes, and none of you are. So start being more loving. Right. So he's, and he's showing how Jesus is, is the epitome of love. And it's all, you know, Paul's writing to a very um, complicated church. We think we've got problems with the church. I mean, Paul talks in there about, um, they're, they're fine with the fact that there's, there's a young man in their congregation uh, who is having an affair with his, um, with his stepmother. And you think, goodness me, what's going on? You know, this is a really messed up church in many ways. But again, Paul is reminding them of the gospel to go back to what they already know. Um, so then Paul writes another letter. Paul actually probably wrote maybe three or four letters. We only have uh, two of them, like one Corinthians and, and, uh, and two Corinthians. Um, and then Paul writes Galatians. Well, that's probably actually his earliest letter. So these aren't in order of um, uh, order of when they were written, but rather they start the longer ones and finish with the with the shorter ones. So it's probably his earliest letter. And the, the context that Paul's writing to there is a is a church who, who are Christians, um, but there's been this big controversy coming along. The controversy that sort of plagued the early church when Paul was writing is. Um, so let's say you've had um, Jewish people who've grown up Jewish, and then they hear about Jesus as the Messiah, and they believe in him, they become Christians in one sense, but they are Jewish Christians. But what do you do about people who haven't grown up Jews, who haven't been circumcised, haven't gone through all the rituals? Can, is it all right for them just to become Christians straight away? Or do they have to become Jewish first? Or do they need to keep some of those elements, like circumcision, because it's a tradition, it's, it's always been done? 
should they have to become Jews first and then Christians? And, and Paul is saying to them, no, you don't need to. Because everything that the, the all the you know circumcision, all of that was pointing towards Jesus, and now that he's come, um, that is enough to have faith in him. But they were being played by people saying, no, if you become a Christian, you weren't Jewish, you still need to be circumcised. You need to keep these kind of these traditions and, and these laws. And, and Paul tells them in no uncertain terms, no, that that's not right. Um, and he contrasts this with talking about freedom, freedom in the spirit. And it's where we get these wonderful verses on the fruit of the spirit, these, these nine wonderful uh, gifts that come from God and that he grows in us. Um, and they are fruit, not because they're, you know, we can't just grow fruit on ourselves. Fruit is organic, isn't it? It comes slowly, it's uh, tender, but it comes from the, the ground and the nutrients and everything, and, and from being a healthy tree. So we have these wonderful fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says that's the mark of being a believer in the Lord Jesus, being a Christian. It doesn't mean you're perfect, none of us are perfect, these things. But it means if you are a believer, these things will gradually be shown in your life. They will be gradually. Do you know, actually, look back 10 years, and I am more patient than I used to be. Um, sometimes we kind of go up and down a bit and we're there. But if we find that actually we're a lot less loving, joyful, or peaceful, or patient, or kind than we were 20 years ago, then maybe we need to have a conversation with about that, um, or I'll chat with you about that. But Paul talks about these um, fruits of the Spirit, which is something God does in us. We can't just manufacture them themselves. I can't say, right, you all need to be more loving. Just be more loving, right? Because that, it doesn't work like that, does it? But he contrasts them with what he calls the works of the flesh, which are things that we do that actually aren't suitable for, for Christians. So he, he makes this list. Um, he talks about sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. So he contrasts these, these, these fruits of the Spirit with these what he calls works of the flesh. Things that, you know, you, you were doing once upon a time, perhaps, this church before they knew Christ before they knew the love of God and Jesus. Um, but that's not suitable anymore. That, that's not the way that you live. Instead, you should be demonstrating fruits of the Spirit. And, and many of those actually contrast with those. So instead of enmity and strife, peace and patience. This is, this is the new way of living in God's kingdom. Um, Paul makes that clear in Galatians. Um, so then moving on, we've got the book of Ephesians. So we have a letter to the Ephesians talking much about um, about the unity in the church. One of Paul's favourite phrases in Ephesians is in Christ. There's a lot to do with unity about being in Christ. Um, and then Philippians uh, as well. Again, for many people that's probably got some of their favourite verses in. Um, chapter 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So it's a wonderful chapter for wonderful encouraging um, words as well. Um, again, in contrast to what was happening in the church in Philippi, uh, when there were two influential women who were basically having a row with each other, and it was causing the church to kind of split a bit. Um, and he's saying, you know, whatever's good, whatever's wonderful that God has done, focus on, on these things. Uh, and then um, we've got uh, the letter to the, the Colossians as well. Um, I don't think about that at the moment. And then we've got two letters to uh, the Thessalonians. And particularly the first letter um, deals with a problem in the church uh, where they were really worried about what had happened 
to believe he's going to die. So they, they, they knew that Jesus was going to come back one day. But some people had said, well, that's already happened. And those people who have died, well, they've missed out. Uh, and they were really anxious about it. That's like a silly thing to be anxious about. But it was something that they were anxious about. Um, and Paul reminds those uh, that those who have died, along with us, have a wonderful inheritance of a great hope to look forward to. We don't need to um, uh, be worried about people who have died before Jesus has come back. He says, we will gather them out and we will meet with him in the end when he returns. Um, so one thing that we learn from you and Paul's letters to the churches is that he only wrote one letter to a group of people who were called Ian. There's Corinth, Ian's, uh, Galatians, So, uh, and then we've got after that Paul's letters to the churches, we've got Paul's letters to individuals, which again have a different feeling to them because he's writing to individual people rather than the whole church. Many of these letters, when they were delivered to a church, were designed to be read out. So, we've just received a letter from the Apostle Paul. <coughs> right, and then read it out. Um, and then perhaps pass it to another church as well. Again, a lot of churches, they weren't meeting in church buildings like this, they were meeting in people's homes or wherever they could meet that was safe. So then we've got Paul's letter to individuals. Uh, and again, he's given different, more an intimate, perhaps, uh, understanding of um, what, he, uh, what God wants us to know. So firstly, we've got um, the two best named letters in the Bible, of course, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Uh, and 1 Timothy um, outlines um, qualifications for leadership. And in particular, Paul isn't saying you've got to find someone who's really sort of outgoing and amazing speaker. But actually what he zooms in on is character. And he's writing to this person, Timothy, who is a bit, probably just a bit terrified of everything that he's having to do. Um, and Paul says this to him in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So he says, you know, don't let people look down on you just because you're younger than them. But rather set an example of what it means to be a Christian in the way that you speak, the way that you act, the way that you love, and the way that you show faith and purity. And then he tells them what he needs to do. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. So he's, he's you know, we're doing that 2,000 years later. We are to publicly read scripture so that people can hear. We're to exhort, to encourage people to take it seriously, and we're to teach it so that people can understand as well. So that pattern for ministry is what the church continues to do um, through all day and, and lay ministers. Um, and then we uh, move on to Titus, and then Philemon. And Philemon, or Philemon, if you want to call it that, um, is again an interesting little letter, very specific in terms of what it's trying to do. So Philemon was a slave owner. Now when we're talking about slaves in, in the Bible, um, we've got to separate the idea of the transatlantic slave trade from what was being talked about. Now God never in the Bible approves of slavery, but slavery, certainly in Roman times, was more similar to this idea of being a servant in, in, a, in a household, sort of, you know, a Victorian household. So, you know, even though the accounts of people uh, willingly going into slavery to, you know, what's it's like a job. And they were there for a few months of years, uh, they've, they've been fed, they've been looked after, uh, and then they, can, then they can leave. And in fact, in the Old Testament, there was really strict laws about how long you were allowed to keep a slave and then you had to set them free. You couldn't just keep them for life. But anyway, there was this chap with Philemon who was a slave owner. And he had a slave called Onesimus. And Onesimus literally means useful. So perhaps it's just a nickname, or useful, you know, can you help me with this box of stuff, you know. But Onesimus met Paul at one point, and anyway, he, was, he, he met Paul, he wasn't a Christian at this point, but Paul spoke with him, and, uh, and Onesimus became a Christian, he, he gave his life to Christ. And, and anyway, well, it, it transpires that Onesimus has left Philemon because he'd stolen from him, that's why he'd stolen from him, and he's fled. So Paul writes this letter to Philemon, saying, please would you take Onesimus back? 
but not as a slave, but as a brother. And the whole point to that is saying that actually he's more useful to you as a Christian brother now than he was to you as a non-Christian slave. And uh, we do read about him in elsewhere, and encouraging that it probably was received back um, with that as well. If Paul wants to let him to do something, he probably should, probably should do it. But again, a very specific letter, but things that we can learn from that um, as well. So those are Paul's letters to the churches and to individuals. And then we've got these other letters. Um, now the first up we've got is the letter to the Hebrews. Now if you look in the King James Version, sometimes that ascribes it to Paul. And they used to think that Paul wrote uh, Hebrews. He may have wrote it, um, he might have probably didn't know. Um, some people think it might be Apollos, um, who was uh, um, someone who they knew was very eloquent, or Barnabas, um, again one of Paul's travelling companions who was a great encourager. The very encouraging letters, perhaps with Barnabas, but honestly, we don't know. But what the letter of Hebrews does is it outlines how Christ fulfills the Old Testament scriptures. So, everything we're looking at in the first three sessions, the writer of the Hebrews shows that Christ fulfills those things. So, like, uh, like Moses uh, and the prophets and, uh, and, and, and the, the judges as well, you know and how Christ is greater than all the things. And um, he's, he's better than what's come before. And then we get um, uh, the epistle of, of James, uh, James, the brother of Jesus. This is probably one of the earliest New Testament writings, probably in the AD 40 to 50, so within about 10 years of Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. And um, it's been likened to the sort of the New Testament there's a lot of wisdom in James about how to live in the kingdom of, of God. And one point that, that James makes is that if you have real faith, it should be able to be seen. There's no point saying you've got faith, but it doesn't make any difference to your life. Uh, it should be able to be seen. There's no use saying you believe if nothing has, has changed. Um, and then we've got uh, 1 and 2 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter dealing with uh, writing to a persecuted people, people who are experiencing uh, real suffering for being, being Christians. And what Peter does is he, he encourages them in their suffering to remember that just like the, the Jews were in Babylon, they are they're essentially exiles, they're, they're living away from their true home. Um, but he says, don't forget that your great inheritance, whatever happens to you in this life, Actually, your greater inheritance is in heaven. And in fact, suffering in this life can actually increase your joy in that inheritance and the treasure that awaits you in heaven uh, when we are with Jesus. Uh, and then we've got three uh, letters from the Apostle John, including uh, two John, which is the shortest letter, a uh, shortest book uh, in the Bible, and, uh, and then uh, Jude as well. So what kind of teachings do we find across those letters? I just want to focus on, on that for, for a few moments. Well, um, we get quite a lot really. Um, and some of this equates the, the kind of the teachings that we get in the letters with being a bit like a highway code. Now they've changed the highway code recently. There's been some slightly strange additions. Like if you're going left in your car and you think someone might cross the road, you have to wait for them. Now, whether someone crashes into you at the back or not, I'm not sure. Well, now a bike is allowed to take up a whole lane as well. Uh, they're not meant to just stay to, to one side. Um, but there's this definition in the highway code, which I think is applicable if we think about um, the Bible as well, that the highway code is a way to behave on the road, and it calls itself a pocket lifesaver. Um, perhaps that's, you know, that's saying too much for itself, but actually we think about what we have in the scriptures and the, the teachings that we have in the New Testament. Actually it is a way to behave on the road, is it the road of life? How we are to behave, how we are to get the most out of life in God's kingdom, it's a pocket lifesaver, stopping us from making um, bad or costly decisions, or when we make those, how we are to get back on the road safely. Um, and highlights the danger again, if you're out on the road and you think you know it all, and you ignore the rules of the road, then you're probably going to end up in danger. So actually what we have here in the New Testament helps us 
so that we, we know how to, how to, how to live. But, but a few of the different sort of doctrines, um, just focusing on some of those themes now, that are common across the letters. Um, the first one is this idea of sin and judgment. Now, that isn't a new idea, the Bible was talking about that all the way back in Genesis 3, with Adam and Eve choosing to turn away from God and make their own decisions. But actually, it's also true to understand is we can't understand why what we as Christians call the good news is good unless we understand that bad news is, is in the world. And as we read in Romans 3, this idea of, you know, we have all fallen short, so we're all in the same boat and it's sinking. We need someone to come and plug the hole and rescue us. And, and this idea of, of sin isn't just this idea of doing naughty things, but it's missing the mark. If you imagine a sort of an archery, um, an archery board, is that what they call it? Oh, Target, at the end of the church, and I'm going for it, and it goes, you know, crashing out the window. So if I miss the mark, I get it wrong, or it falls short, I don't put enough power to it. And that idea that we're all kind of missing the mark, sometimes it's because we're doing it on purpose, and we don't want to make the mark, or sometimes we try and we, we don't do it, but we, we need rescuing from that. Um, so there is this no idea that there's the best person in the world and the worst person in the world. Was, um, someone said it's not like there's the person on top of the mountain and there's the person uh, at the bottom of the valley. Sometimes it might feel like that there's people like that, but even if you've got someone at the top of the mountain and the bottom of the valley, you're still a million miles from the stars, aren't you? So whether, wherever you are, we all need um, that rescue from, from sin. Judgment. But there's, you know, sometimes people say, you know, throw all fashion to talk about sin and judgment. We don't want to talk about that. But actually, there's a sense that it's free, that we can be honest. That, you yeah, know, we all get things wrong. And we don't have to pretend that we're perfect. What a terrible burden to carry, pretending that we're perfect and, and that we don't uh, mess up from time to time. Much better to be honest uh, with ourselves and with each other and with God. Um, but another doctrine that comes up is the fact that Jesus is. God's Son and our Holy Saviour. Now, in the early church, I'm sure you're familiar, they would use this uh, symbol of the fish uh, as a sort of a secret sign that they were Christians there, maybe outside of uh, the house or something, no, there were uh, Christians there. And the reason why they chose the fish, well, we see uh, Jesus, um, you know, uh, using fish in miracles uh, in the Gospels, don't we? Miraculous catch of fish and feeding the 5,000 um, as well. So, just a, a few, but also um, one of the reasons you see these Greek initials in there as well. This is acrostic, um, ichthus meaning fish uh, in, in Greek, with each letter standing for something. So, Jesus Christos, Theos, Quios, Soter, um, and each one of those letters, so uh, standing for in Greek, Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. So I thought, well, that, that's a good, good match, isn't it? So, Ichthus, um, Jesus Christ, God, Son, and Saviour. So, a good sort of uh, symbol for that. Um, but we see this idea that, that Jesus is God's Son, He is our only Saviour. Um, and that was very countercultural. Um, Paul says, you know, this, this cry uh, is central to Christianity, saying that Jesus is Lord. And we say, yes, Jesus is Lord, you might think of that image. Um, but actually, in Rome, 2,000 years ago, the banners that were everywhere that you have to sign up to as a Roman citizen was Caesar is Lord. So a lot of the Christians were persecuted because they couldn't say Caesar is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's the true Lord. Caesar isn't really God. See, he might think he is. And, uh, and the question is, were, were you going to say that Caesar is Lord and, and live a, you know, an easier life? Or were you going to refuse to say that and face persecution, perhaps, or even death? Uh, we know that during the time these letters were written, and then shortly afterwards, the persecution of Christians was terrible. You know? um, Christians burnt at, at the stake, crucified, broke to the lines, all sorts of horrible persecution, in addition to having to flee their homes and, and loved ones as well. And another key doctrine we see in the letters is, of course, the cross. And that the cross is the answer for how God is going to save his people. It's God's grace for our salvation. 
And, and often we think about the cross as the place where Jesus took away our, our sin. Um, but the cross is also important because the cross is also the place where Jesus gave us something in return. Um, and Paul especially makes this argument um, that at the cross, Jesus took away our sin, but he also gave us his righteousness. So his goodness, his, his perfect record with, with God so that we can be accepted into God's family. Not just that we've had our sins forgiven, but we've been given Jesus' goodness too. Um, this was really brought home to me when I went out to a, um, uh, a lambing session out, uh, out the farm on the downs a couple of years ago. And I saw there was this one lamb in this paddock with a, with a sheep and a couple of other lambs as well. And it had this strange thing on its neck and its skin looked a bit too baggy. And uh, another farmer so I said, what's this? Why does it look so strange? And he said, well, that lamb was an orphan. And uh, this, this year she had two or three. And one of the lambs, one of her lambs, died. So what we do is, well, so you have to take the lamb away. But they skin the dead lamb. They take its, its coat off of it. And if they've got an orphan that doesn't have a mother, they clothe that lamb in the dead lamb's clothes. You know, in, in its skin, only temporarily. Because then what happens is the ewe smells that lamb. That's mine. So this lamb is, is clothed in a new kind of skin so that it's accepted into that family. Just what a wonderful picture of what Jesus has done. As the Lamb of God, I'm sure it's no accident, or not a new thing that, that shepherds uh, do that. You know, a different Lamb, the orphan Lamb, clothed in the Lamb that had died, so that it's now welcomed into that new family. That's, uh, that's incredible, isn't it? Um, one of the other things we see, of course, is the resurrection, uh, which, uh, again, we'll be thinking about lots in the next couple of weeks. Um, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the resurrection. Um, but he, you know, saying that Jesus rose from the dead, and this of course means that Jesus is uh, unlike any other religious figure. Uh, if you go to Medina, you're not allowed to see it, but apparently that is where Muhammad, his body is, is laid. Um, now, obviously, if they find the bones of, of Jesus, um, then uh, it turns out that the resurrection is alive. But obviously they, they haven't happened yet. And the proof that we've seen in the life of the disciples and, and how God continues to work is that Jesus rose again from the dead and that he is uh, alive. But Paul makes the case that if the resurrection didn't happen, then we're just wasting more time. Uh, which is why the resurrection is so fundamental in terms of the doctrines of uh, the New Testament. Next thing we, we read about is, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, the Holy Spirit works in all sorts of um, so firstly, one of the ways the Holy Spirit works is to enable us to have an experience of God. Perhaps there's been a time in your life, maybe things were really hard, and there's been some, some kind of experience of God and knowing Him or, or have some kind of tangible presence. Well, that was the Holy Spirit uh, at work. Um, it's been my experience that that doesn't often happen. I think there's probably been a few occasions where something like that has happened. But it's not a bad thing to, to ask for that we would experience the Holy Spirit at work in our lives in some way. Sometimes it is often um, connected with a time of, of suffering or more hardship as well. We almost need to know the idea that God is especially close to us uh, at that time. But the New Testament also says that the Holy Spirit equips believers. Uh, believers um, but the Holy Spirit is, is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. He can experience... Um, uh, uh, which is the Holy Spirit grieves when, 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 we, when we sin. So you know, he can experience pain like that. Um, but he's always pointing to Jesus, um, away from himself and pointing uh, to Jesus. We, we thought about earlier the fruit of the Spirit, he produces fruit in the life of believers. As we see in 2 Timothy, uh, it's uh, God through the Holy Spirit who inspired the Scriptures. They are God breathed. Holy Spirit at work um, in the scriptures as they were inspired and as we, uh, as we read them today as well. Um, another doctrine that is in the New Testament but isn't given an official name is that the Trinity. So there's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> it's just a cathedral, yeah. So it's the, it's the John Piper Tapestry. And uh, I was watching a video the other day and it was explaining some of the bits to it. So um, it's obviously very abstract. Um, 
but you've got here one, two, three, four. So you've got the four advantages of that kind of job. Um, and some kind of abstract symbols, you know, I'm not quite sure what they are, there's some flames and water there, I'm not quite sure what it looks like, well, I'm not quite sure what that could be. But then anyway, within the middle, you've got this, this sort of symbol of the Trinity there as, as well. And also it's quite hard to, you know, how do you, um, how do you illustrate the Trinity? There's that famous Rublev icon as well, the, the Trinity sort of sat around the table and was inviting you in. Um, but this, I thought, was quite an interesting one. You've got what's called a tau cross, uh, which is a, a symbol of the cross. So you've got Jesus inside of the bed. You've got a flame, so a symbol of the Holy Spirit, like the Pentecost. And then finally, how do you represent God the Father in the Spirit as well? But the idea of this is it's the idea of light. Um, New Testament talk about God dwells in, uh, dwells in unapproachable light as well. So that uh, sort of join together in this triangle. So, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, yeah, one God. Um, that's spoken about as well. And then, um, two other things on that. The, the New Testament obviously talks about the church. has a lot to say about the church. We think about the churches that the apostles were writing to. Um, but the church not just being this, this club, or this collection of people, or a nice thing that we do, but it being the body of Christ. That each of us are uh, members, we're a part of it. We're, uh, you know, in Peter's language, we're, we're living stones built together. Christ is the cornerstone, we're all built into this household around him. Paul's metaphors about these members of the body needing each other. Um, we are the body of Christ together. Um, or, or other language that we see as well used is that the church is the bride of Christ. Do you remember how um, some of the language of the Old Testament is talking about the people being like a, a bride and God being the, the, the groom. While that language is used to fresh in the New Testament to talk about the church as the bride of Christ. Christ is the groom, he is sacrificed for his bride. And then the last thing we come on to our, our final book in the Bible is what the New Testament letters also describe, talking about the fact that Jesus is coming back. Now, it might make the case that something probably we don't dwell on as much. We think about, you know, God being with us today and, and tomorrow. But this idea that the New Testament writers make very clear that one day Jesus is coming back. There's not a new idea, it's there in the Old Testament as well, that Jesus will return one day. There is a new kingdom, the perfect kingdom, and there's not going to be any more pain or suffering. Jesus is coming back. But I think it's particularly hard for us in, in the West. I think probably if you're in Ukraine, or if you're in Afghanistan, or, or somewhere else, where it's, life is really tough, then probably that idea that Jesus is coming back is, is probably more in front of your mind if you're a believer than it probably is here. Because, you know, we've got things to be getting on with, and, and we've got all these, you know, lots of sort of creature comforts and stuff, which means we can sometimes get distracted from thinking about this future um, event, whether that's tomorrow or whether it's a thousand years time that Jesus is coming back. Which leads us on rightly to our last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Now this picks up on this idea that there is a kingdom yet to come. Um, and, and Revelation is a new genre in and of itself really. It's what we call um, apocalyptic. Now the only other place really that we find that there are a few little bits in the Gospels um, where Jesus is, is talking about this, sort of this future time, but also at the end of Daniel as well. That has that kind of apocalyptic um, idea, this, this new world, this new age um, to come. Um, and Revelation is split again into sort of two sections. The first bit of Revelation kind of describes um, John, uh, the Apostle John. He was an exile on Greek island of Patmos, which is sort of the east and sort of the Greek um, islands. Uh, he, he was an exile there, they chucked him there because he was a Christian troublemaker. And uh, he receives uh, this vision and meets with um, Jesus and given these prophecies of things to come. But firstly, he's given these, little, these messages to, to give to seven churches, these seven uh, letters. And um, these, these seven letters include uh, encouragements, challenges, rebukes, 
um, like some of the other letters that we've seen to, to Paul, uh, sorry, from Paul to, to the churches. And so, for example, we, we read this in the letter to the church of Laodicea, again, famous uh, one, I think, the whole one painting, uh, Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. So we get some uh, very powerful, uh, moving stuff in those, those letters. Again, things that are still relevant to many churches today, like the warning of being lukewarm Christians, neither hot nor cold. You're just a bit lukewarm. I like being lukewarm. You know, if I'm in a bath, I like it to be warm. I don't like it to be hot or cold. But actually, lukewarm Christians can sort of drift into the background. No one knows that we're there. Just get on with things quietly. But actually, God, God wants us to be warming others. He wants us to be bringing uh, heat and life. He uh, wants us to be uh, lukewarm. And this coffee was very nice when it started, but now it's got to that stage of being a bit lukewarm. And my enjoyment levels of drinking the coffee have gone down as it's got cold. Until that is a bit cold now. But, um, so we don't want to be lukewarm Christians. Uh, and that's what Jesus is saying. Now, and, and then Revelation, um, a lot of people struggle with this because there's some of the imagery. If you've ever read it or verses in it, um, a lot of you read it and think, goodness me, what's going on? There's some very bizarre, strange descriptions of all these beings and all these people. Um, so it's, it's worth thinking when we're reading Revelation, it's, it's a genre kind of in and of itself. Um, it's describing current and future events in a very specific way um, and a very sort of um, very sort of uh, stylized uh, way. So when you're reading it, it is a challenge not to take it 100% literally. Of course it's still true, but it doesn't mean when we have to be thinking about these, um, this is what this absolutely looks like. So one example might be, we have, we have almost no descriptions of what Jesus looked like. So we have our drawings, our paintings, but we don't necessarily know. But we do get a, um, a description here of Jesus, which again, we might not say we take this literally, but we think about what are the pictures telling us about what he's like. So um, John, the beginning, he says, he says, I saw someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool. So Jesus is wearing a long, this is Jesus, he's described as wearing a long robe, golden sash, he's got white woolly hair, so it's probably not smooth and straight like ours. So if anything, it's, it's woolly, it's thicker hair, but it's white, um, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he had seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. Now, we might, if we got to heaven, and that's a literal description of Jesus, we'd be like, wow, you're right, <laughs> you're kidding me. Um, but it's saying things, isn't it? It's saying, so the double-edged sword being in terms of Jesus' word being powerful, it cuts through arguments, you know, it's, it's deeply symbolic language describing what Jesus is like, not necessarily just picturing him. Sometimes on the challenge of reading revelations, we, we think very pictorially about, about these things, and that's sometimes why we can find it um, quite hard. But there are all these sort of strange other pictures uh, and accounts in, in Revelation as well. And numbers are very significant in Revelation, but particularly the number seven. Uh, there are seven seals that are, that are open, as in seals and letter, not as in the whole, whole time. Um, seven trumpets. We read about the fall of, of Babylon, which again is sy symbolic because Babylon fell hundreds of years before this happened anyway. But Babylon has been invoked as, as, as a as a name for sort of the enemies um, of God uh, as well. Um, again, we see all sorts of strange things in there, like the, the mark of the beast, um, which people spend all this time trying to work out what this means. A lot of re-interest in that recently with the COVID vaccine, saying don't have the vaccine, it's the mark of the beast. Um, some people believe, believe in that. Um, I don't believe that personally. Um, but it shows that we need to be careful. A lot of people have read different things in, in Revelation. Um, and it's important that we do it together. Don't not read it. Do read it. It's a great, um, great.
great uh, encouragement to us in so many ways, um, particularly as you get nearer towards the, the last two chapters. And the last two chapters um, are wonderful. The last two chapters of the Bible uh, are talking about the new Jerusalem. Uh, and on the way to that, it, it describes the thousand year rule of Jesus. Now, whether again that's a literal thousand years or that's symbolic, again, that's down to the reader to uh, interpret that for themselves. Um, a lot of people have been very definite on one side or another. And he talks about the final judgments, the judgment of Satan, God's, uh, God's enemy, and, and, and those who have um, persecuted and uh, who have turned away from God. Um, and the judgment of, of all uh, before the great white throne includes some unpleasant descriptions of, of hell and what it means to, to turn away from the living God uh, and to face punishment. Um, but at the same time, wonderful descriptions of heaven. Um, that there are all sorts of people there, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Imagine this, the sound of them, different nations and languages singing together. It's going to be incredible. Wonderful descriptions, all sorts of people there, and probably some surprises as well, in terms of who we see there as well. Um, but what we're told about what happens at the end of Revelation and as this new kingdom is that uh, everything now, like the universe we live in, will almost be like rolled up like a scroll, and there will be a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. And sometimes we think uh, the aim of being a Christian. So that when I die, I go up to be in heaven, and that's it. Well, actually, Revelation says, well, no, the goal of being a Christian, uh, and this is something that I'm writing with Tom Wright really picks up on, is that actually it's the consummation of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth coming together in this new creation where God is with his people. And, and it won't just be only oh, left earth behind, but heaven and earth will be joined together in some wonderful way. Uh, we read this, uh, these wonderful uh, words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I get used to get worried about that, because I quite like the sea. But sea again being symbolic of chaos. Sea, you didn't know what was under there, you know, it was all this strange thing, but in terms of the chaos and the confusion that's gone. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. There's that imagery of the bride as well. Um, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. So that's his presence. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. It sounds very big and grand, right, doesn't it? You might get lost in there. At the same time, he then goes on to say this He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Suddenly it's got very intimate. I don't know if you'd ever let anyone wipe tears from your eyes, but that's how close God is to his people in these new heavens and new earth. He says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So this will be the new kingdom. Then, uh, and then, then we read on as well, and we get the description of a tree. And actually what happens here is the Bible has gone full circle. What did we start with in, in the Garden of Eden? We started with a tree, didn't we? The, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, Adam and Eve obviously they left the garden. And then what do we have here in the name of Revelation? We have a tree. And it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. So they tried to show how it could be on either side, uh, but still one tree. There are twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So there is this full circle. Um, and in fact, it's interesting, the word that John uses for the tree is the same word that Peter uses for the cross. So how do we get from one tree to the other tree? It's through that tree. Um, so there's wonderful kind of symmetry in, 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 in the Bible. 
The witness says we see God's face, face to face. We receive that inheritance lined up for all those who love him. It's the perfect kingdom of our perfect king. And then John finishes this, saying, he who testifies to these things say yes, uh, says that. Uh, so Jesus is saying, yes, I am coming soon. John replies, Amen, come Lord Jesus. He actually uses an Aramaic saying, Maranatha, which means come Lord Jesus. And he finishes with this saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. And that's where it finishes. Or perhaps you might say that's where it starts. <laughs> in this new heaven and this new earth. So I thought, actually, we're thinking about there and, and, and this, this, this sort of this, this new place of worship. Perhaps we want to respond uh, with doing that. So I thought perhaps we could sing um, Amazing Grace. The words can come up on the screen. Perhaps you'd like to stand and we can sing that together as we finish.
face. Um, I hope you're looking forward to it. Um, I know I am. And one thing just for you to think about as we go away. Um, what is the one thing then that you might do as a result of this, this Bible or overview? Um, just keep it simple, one thing. Uh, it may be that you want to think about looking at one of these books. Uh, it may be that you might want to share what you've learned with someone else. Uh, it may be that you want to do some kind of read the Bible through during a year or some kind of reading plan. Think about what one thing, don't give it too long, what one thing might you do as a result of this. And I hope it's been helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Well done. The listening for the yammer on for five hours. <laughs> in a lovely audience. Uh, let me continue this as a closing prayer. And then I've got something that's special as well. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are good and that you show me the Bible and how your kingdom is revealed, ruled, prophesied, coming and to come. And we look forward to the day when we gather with all your people in the new heavens and the new earth with you and we look on you face to face. What a wonderful uh, new kind of living that will be. There's no more death, no more sadness or sickness, but life as it should be. We look forward to that day. Please help us, Lord, as we listen to and as we read the Bible. Um, that we would remember how it works together to show what you are like and what it means to live in your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Tim, I'd like to say a big thank you for putting that together. But I've got one question on this. You had asked for